heedfulness, as the Buddha said, is the basis for all skillful qualities. There are only two passages I've been able to find, though, where he defines heedfulness. One is not resting content with what you've got in terms of your skillful qualities. And the other is guarding your mind against what he calls the effluence and things associated with the effluence. Of course, that, that leads to the next question, what are the effluence? The Pali word asava literally means things that flow out of the mind. And in some cases, the Buddha defines them as sensuality, becoming, and ignorance. But there's a sutta where he talks about the affluence, and it sounds like anything that would create trouble for the mind. He talks about seven different ways of dealing with the affluence. And in the course of the discussion, you realize that some of the affluence are pretty deep and subtle things going on in the mind, and others are pretty obvious. The seven are these. They're the affluence that are dealt with by seeing. And here the Buddha means seeing what questions are worthy of your attention, which ones are not. Questions like, who am I? What was I in the past? What am I going to be in the future? What is my true self? Those, he says, are not worth your attention. Because if you follow them, you get entangled in all kinds of views. Views that you have a self, views that you have no self. Both of which are to be avoided, because as the Buddha said elsewhere, when you start defining yourself, you place limitations on yourself. So you avoid those questions, and you focus instead on the questions of what is suffering, what leads to suffering, what can be done to put an end to suffering. Those questions are useful. So right now, as you're meditating, what are you going to do to help put an end to suffering? Well, you develop concentration, you develop mindfulness. What you're doing is developing the path. And so when you pay attention to this, what can I do to make the path stronger? What can I do to make the path more subtle? And those are useful things to pay attention to. And that way you cut through all that, what the Buddha calls a thicket of views, a tangle of views, a wilderness of views surrounding your questions of your identity. Instead you focus on what you're doing, less on what you are and more on what you can do. And when you focus on what you're doing, you find that even your sense of self, after a while, is a, something that you do. And there are times when it's useful, and there are times when it's not. And you find there are many senses of self. So you sort through them. Try to figure out which ones are the most helpful, which ones are least, and then you learn to stop doing the ones that are not helpful, and continue doing the ones that are helpful up to the point where you don't need them anymore. So that's how you deal with the effluence that can be dealt with by seeing. Then the effluence that to be dealt with by restraining. In other words, as the Buddha said, you restrain your eyes and ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. If you find that you're thinking about things or looking at things or listening to things in a way that gives rise to greed or aversion and delusion, you, you try to stop. Either you change the way you look or listen, or you just don't look or listen at those, look at or listen to those things at all. You don't have to go around with blinders on all the time, but you have to be careful about when you're looking at something, why you're looking at it. This is especially true when you're online. It's not like the images jump out at you. You have to turn the computer on, decide which place you're going to go. And so you're making some choices. What do you want to look at? Why? You should ask yourself these questions again and again. Because what's doing the looking? Is it greed doing the looking? Is anger doing the looking? Fear? Why don't you have discernment doing the looking? Why don't you have goodwill doing the looking? Equanimity doing the looking? Because the reason why you're looking will also stir up results. And you don't want to stir up results that go to more greed, more aversion, more delusion. So you look carefully at how you're using your senses, because your senses both are tools for the mind and also have their impact on the mind. And you want to make sure that that impact is good. 
than they're there for us to be to be dealt with by using. In other words, when you use your requisites, when you eat food, when you <clears throat> when you use clothing, use shelter, use medicine, then why are you doing it? There are some perfectly good reasons for using these things, but there are also some reasons that are not so good. And you realize that the extent to which you have to use these things is placing a burden on others. And so you use them for a good purpose. And you read restaurant reviews in the New Yorker and you begin to realize that people are not just there for nourishment. It's gone beyond. There's the status, there's the whatever. If eating were just about nourishment, most restaurants would go out of business. But you don't have to be concerned about their going out of business. You have to ask yourself, what is this encouraging in my own mind? What is this encouraging in my impact on the environment around me? Do you eat for play or do you eat for, for nourishment? Do you eat for putting on extra bulk? Or do you eat to find something entertaining, new entertaining combinations that no one has ever thought of before? You have to think about how your eating and how your use of clothing and shelter has an impact on you and on the environment around you. And when you're more reflective like this, again, that deals with the effluence that surround our general greed for the requisites. And there are the effluence to be dealt with by developing. This is developing qualities like mindfulness. Analysis of qualities, in other words, all the factors for awakening, things that we're trying to develop right now as we meditate. You try to be mindful of the breath. You analyze what's going well, what's not going well with the breath. And if you find something's not going well, then you do your best to change it. If it's going well, you do your best to maintain it. That's persistence as a factor for awakening. And when you do it right, it should lead to a, <coughs> lead to a sense of rapture, a sense of fullness, Sometimes a sense of energy coursing through the body, and that can lead to calm. Sometimes the rapture can get you stirred up, but then it nourishes something in the body and the mind, and you don't need that nourishment anymore, and you can go beyond it. You calm down, get the mind into concentration, and the deeper it goes into concentration, the stronger the equanimity in the mind becomes. All these are qualities you want to develop. So you have a basis for dealing with the greed and aversion and the sensuality, the desire for becoming all these things that would come flowing out of the mind otherwise. When you meditate, you're creating a good state of becoming, a state of becoming that has a pleasure that does not need to depend on sensuality. And it's a pleasure that, unlike a lot of pleasures in the world, doesn't lead to delusion. It actually leads to clarity. And finally, there are a set of three types of affluence to make a good combination. There are the affluence that are to be dealt with by tolerating, and the ones to be dealt with by not tolerating, and the ones to be dealt with by avoiding. Tolerating here means two things. One, tolerating unpleasant words from other people, and two, learning how to tolerate pain. We live in a human world, and the nature of human speech is sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's friendly, sometimes it's un unfriendly. Sometimes it means well, sometimes it doesn't mean well. We have to realize that this is just the way speech is. This is what we're going to hear as human beings. So we learn not to get worked up. We just think, okay, there's an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear, as the Buddha said, and then you just leave it there. You don't use it to stab at yourself or to stab at other people. And as for pain, if we're going to learn about pain, which is a lot of what the First Noble Truth is about, you have to learn how to sit with it. And in sitting with it, it's not simply for the sake of enduring it. You're trying to understand it. Why is it the mind takes the pain and makes an issue out of it? 
it seems normal that it would, but then we're trying to get to something beyond normal. So you have to ask yourself, what can I do that enables me to be with pain but not suffer from it? A lot of this has to do with the perceptions, the labels you apply to the pain. Where the pain is in the body, how it's affecting you. Sometimes you find that the mind actually thinks that the pain has a will. We have all kinds of strange ideas around pain, many of which we picked up even before we knew language. We come out of the mother's womb, there's pain right there. And there's nobody who can explain it to us at that point because we don't understand language. And so we develop a lot of weird ideas about pain, which if they go unexamined, they continue to do a lot of damage. So we try to get the mind still and examine what is it about the pain? What is it? What are these my perceptions about the pain? Do I actually believe it has a will? Do I actually believe that it's the same thing as my knee, say if it's in the knee? Is it coming at me? Is it going away? If you can perceive it as moments of pain going away instead of a big block of solid pain coming right at you, you change your relationship to it. And in changing the relationship, you find that you can endure it a lot better. So these are the two things that you deal with by tolerating unkind words and physical pain. The things you don't tolerate are thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of harmfulness as they come up in the mind. In other words, you don't just let them sit there and you don't say, well, let's look into this sensual desire here. This looks, looks like it's fun. You've got to say, nope, got to keep it out of the mind. Thoughts of ill will especially. You don't fantasize about seeing other people suffer. Harmfulness is similar to ill will. The idea you see someone already suffering, you want to add a little bit more. If any thought like this comes in, this is something you do not tolerate. The voice says you wipe it out of existence as quickly as you can. And that means, of course, you don't just repress it. it means you, repressing means you deny that it's there. You basically try to understand it. Why would the mind go for this kind of thing to begin with? You've got to look for where's the allure here? What do I like about this? Watch for these things as they arise. Watch for them as they pass away and you begin to see. Why does the mind latch on to these things? Why does it run with them? What is, as John Lee would say, why does it continue weaving them into a longer and longer piece of cloth? If you really see why you go for these things, then you can compare the allure with the drawbacks. And you realize the drawbacks are a lot worse, a lot heavier. And the allure is not worth much. Then you let go. The problem is all too often we're not honest with ourselves about what the allure is. That's just why we have to keep going over these issues again and again and again until we understand. Until there's that little flash out of the corner of your eye, you see the mind going for, the, say, sensuality or going for ill will. For some pretty paltry reasons, but because you've hidden them from yourself, they're able to do their work and yet not really amount to much when you actually look at them. So that's another reason why we have to get the mind really quiet and still, and why we have to do it not only while we're sitting here with our eyes closed, but as we go through the day, so we can catch the mind as it goes for these things. Then finally, there are the effluents to be dealt with by avoiding them. And these are basically common sense things of not putting yourself in danger. As the Buddha expresses it, you avoid going out at night. You avoid stumbling into hedges. You avoid stumbling over cows. You avoid falling into cesspools. Pretty commonsensical stuff. But sometimes when we're practicing the Dharma, we lack common sense. We hear about the Dharma protecting us, or we hear about our good intentions protecting us. We think, well, we don't have to be wary about the world around us. But the Buddha never said that. I mean, the protection you get from the Dharma is that you are not creating any new bad karma right now, but it doesn't protect you from your old bad karma. So you still have to watch out. 
and that was with a John Fuga. He was a very wary person, wary of dealing with other people. He wouldn't trust people right away. He would watch them for a while. When I lived with him, it was two or three years before I was even allowed in his room. I eventually became his attendant. Then it became my duty. I had to clean up his room and arrange everything. But he wouldn't allow me in there until he felt that he could really trust me. And when different issues came up in the monastery, and so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that, he would sometimes ask trick questions to see how you would respond, to check to see if the accusation was true. He wouldn't come right out and, and trust people right away, because he'd learned dealing with his own defilements. You can't trust your own defilements. Other people have defilements. How can you trust them? So you've got to keep your guard up. And you can't believe that simply having good intentions is going to be enough. After all, the Buddha said, it's not good intentions, it's skillful intentions that matter. And that means you have to be circumspect. So you can avoid dangers. There was an interesting story one time about a woman who came to the monastery to meditate. And she was a friend of the, one of the cooks in the monastery, and the friend had told us that this woman had a problem. Every time she sat down to meditate, she would start shaking. So sure enough, she came to the monastery, was sitting in front of a John Fung, and started shaking. And John Fung had a student who had some psychic abilities, and so he said, look at her, check out and see what's going wrong with her. So the woman sat in meditation, and she saw the other woman being shaken by these two beings that looked pretty, pretty nasty. So in her vision, she confronted them and said, why are you shaking her? Well, they turned on her, scared her so much that she went out and threw up. She went back to see a John Fuang, and the John Fuang said, you fool, you've got to protect yourself when you're dealing with things like this. And for her, the protection meant filling her body with light, filling her body with good breath energy, filling her body with her awareness, then spreading goodwill to those beings, and then talking to them. And then she found out the beings had been this woman's parents in a previous lifetime, and she killed them. And when they saw her meditating, they felt that she would get away. There's more to the story, but the important thing here is that even in dealing on these levels, you have to protect yourself. All the more so in dealing with everyday human beings. So these are the different ways that you embody heedfulness in your practice. You realize that there are troubles that can come from within the mind, there are troubles that can come from without. And you do your best to guard yourself, because ultimately that's what heedfulness means. It means that there are dangers inside and out. And you've got to protect yourself. The good thing about heedfulness is the implication that if you protect yourself well, you can come out unscathed, or at least with a minimum amount of damage. But you can't be complacent. It's your actions that will make a difference. It's not simply that good intentions have a magical protection, protective ability. You have good intentions, you want to make them skillful, and you want to make them circumspect. So that you protect yourself from danger on all sides. And that's how the mind becomes skillful. <laughs>